I'm ready. Good morning. And I'd like to thank each panelist that is a candidate for the United States Senate that will represent us in our nation's capital. My name is Clarence P. Nicholas. I'm the president of the NAACP branch here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Our sponsors are Pastors United, Dane County NAACP, Unity Plus Action Equal Power, both. We are a coalition of one. Uh, this forum is being recorded and will be aired on our Facebook page. It would also be put on our website. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, chairman of our political actions committee here in Milwaukee, Ricky Townsell. Please begin, Mr. Townsell. Good morning. My name is Ricky Townsell, and it's my pleasure and honor to welcome the panelists for our senatorial forum webinar today. And those of you of our listening audience, the candidates present, present today feel as we do that if we are to make an informed decision, we have a right to find out how they feel their, their positions on the questions that are of importance to you. The questions we have today were, uh, well, we'll get into that further. Without further delay, let us begin with the ground rules. Each candidate will have two minutes for an introduction and an opening statement. They will also have two minutes for their closing statement. I will ask 10 prepared questions, time permitting, randomly chosen from the Milwaukee community at large. Each candidate will have an opportunity to answer the question uninterrupted. The same question will be asked of each candidate. Hello, Mr. Koo. And Mr. Lee, I'm sorry. Mr. Lee, how are you? Good morning, Mr. Nichols. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, I'm, I'm Ricky Townsell. I'm the moderator for today's event. And I was just going over the ground rules. And since you just joined us and I'm only halfway through, I'll, I'll start over again. Uh, each candidate will have Thank two you. minutes for their introduction and opening statement. You have two minutes for your closing as well. I have 10 prepared questions that I'm going to ask, time permitting, that have been randomly chosen from the Milwaukee community at large. Each of you will have an opportunity to answer the question uninterrupted. The same question will be asked of each of you. A clock will appear on the screen where the NAAC logo is currently. Once you begin talking, when your two minutes are up, you will hear a buzz. You'll also get a 30 second warning. Please cease speaking at that time or the controller will mute your audio and I'll have to move on to the next question or candidate. We'll begin the questioning in alphabetical order. We'll reverse the order for each oh. question so that each of you would have an opportunity to go first, in the middle, and last. If you need the question restated before answering, that will not count against your time. If a candidate enters the forum after we have begun, uh, that candidate will have the opportunity to give their two minute introduction and opening statement, and then they'll fall into the rotation. I won't read these uh, guidelines again as people uh, come into the forum if they come in late. Uh, I'll just answer questions as needed. Does either of you have any questions of me at this time? Well, excellent. Let us proceed with the opening statements. Lieutenant Governor Burns, please. Just had to get off mute. I want to thank you so much uh, to the NAACP for hosting this forum. It's important that we get the information out uh, to the membership and to the larger community. I'm Mandela Barnes, <clears throat> proudly serving as the 45th Lieutenant Governor of the state of Wisconsin, and I'm running for the U.S. Senate to help rebuild the middle class. Now, I don't come from a wealthy family, and I don't come from a well-connected or a political family. I come from a hard-working union household. My dad worked third shift on the assembly line. My mother was a public school teacher, and those jobs gave me opportunity so many people could only dream of, but unfortunately, today it's getting tougher for people. But in 2004, 
heard Barack Obama's DNC speech and I was encouraged. I felt like things around me could change. I felt like we didn't have to settle for things the way they were. So I became an organizer. And that's where I met so many of you uh, in the NAACP when I was working for MICA. And after fighting so hard on any number of issues that came up, I ran for state representative and I took on the Scott Walker agenda, the same agenda that took away opportunities from families like mine and communities like mine. And after that, I ran for Lieutenant Governor in 2018, and we finally kicked Scott Walker out of office. But the way we did that is by having the highest midterm turnout in the history of the state. And it's been the honor of my life serving as Lieutenant Governor, helping provide pandemic relief, helping our small businesses, and also helping working families get a fair shot. But as I look around, times are getting harder for people. Our industries are in crisis, manufacturing is suffering, our small family farms are being squeezed out, and middle class and working class families are paying more at the pump and more at the grocery store. And we have people like Ron Johnson, who, are, who has been sitting in office doing nothing but serving himself and the wealthy people in his tax bracket. We deserve so much more. And there's so much that unites us all across the state of Wisconsin, all 72 counties and divides us. And that's why I'm running for the U.S. Senate to help kick him out of office, to bring a working class voice to the state Senate. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor Burns. Um, let's welcome Mr. Pekarski. I hope I pronounced your name correctly to our forum. And sir, you will have two minutes we're doing things alphabetically. When you're in the road, you're now in the rotation, you'll have two minutes for an introduction and opening statement. Right now, uh, we'll go to Mr. Alex Lazarus. Well, thank you, Ricky. And <clears throat> thank you to the MAACP for, uh, for hosting this. Um, this is a great forum and I really appreciate everyone joining. Uh, I'm Alex Lazarus, and I was the senior vice president for the Milwaukee Bucks before I jumped in this race. And I got in this race because I thought we needed a change in Washington, you know, whether it's his conspiracy theorizing or just general indifference to the job. You know, Ron Johnson has shown us time and time again that he's not up to the task of representing us in the U.S. Senate. And that's been a really big problem for us, because that means for the last 12 years, we've only had one person in Washington fighting on our behalf and fighting for our interests. And that's what this race is about, is how to give Tammy Baldwin a real partner in D.C., to bring some real change and real results for the people of Wisconsin. And what I thought we needed in that candidate was something different. Uh, I'm not a career politician, but I have worked in the highest levels of politics, whether it's the Obama White House, uh, working for Valerie Jarrett, uh, working on the Hill, or leading the bid to bring the Democratic Convention here to Wisconsin. But I've also got a track record of, of success in the community, right? When it comes to raising wages, we made sure that we pay a $15 minimum wage in Pfizer form. When it comes to creating jobs, and we created thousands of good paying union jobs right here in Wisconsin, ensuring that those jobs were being created for some of our hardest hitting zip codes and making sure that we were creating careers. Uh, when it came to bringing investment, we made sure that 80% of our materials were sourced right here from Wisconsin and ensured that a third of our contracts went to minority owned, women owned, disadvantaged businesses. And that to me is what we need. We need someone who's got a proven track record because if you wanna know what someone's gonna do in Washington, you've got to look at what someone's done. And you know those values are what I've grown up with. Um, my dad was an is an immigrant. He came here from Morocco and came here with no money and spoke no English, but he got a good public school education. Uh, he graduated from college without debt and was able to find a good union job. He was a teamster driving UPS trucks. And unfortunately, that story is really hard to write today and it's harder for everyone to achieve. And that's why I'm running, to make sure that we can make that story and that opportunity available to everyone again. Thank you, Mr. Lazary. Mr. Lee, you're in the box. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, uh, NWCP, the Milwaukee branch for uh, hosting this event. It's an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Ku Lee. I am a local businessman from Green Bay. I survived the Secret War in Southeast Asia thanks to my parents. You know, I overcame extreme poverty in refugee camp in Thailand as a child. <coughs> I'm growing up in the rough inner city, dangerous and violent struggles in Detroit ghettos and um, language barriers and cultural challenges as a youth. As a youth, having a right here in the United States, uh, I saw the face of communist evil in my native land in Laos. I will never forget my humble beginning as my father, uncles, grandfather, and his generation laid the ultimate sacrifice by putting their lives on the line alone 
uh, working along the CIA to strategically defend uh, the northern border of Laos and also to rescue uh, down American pilot deep in the uh, enemy territories during the Vietnam War. I believe politics is a personal ambition, uh, compassion towards improving the life of your community, your country, and the American people. I have a strong compassion for people and say uh, change for the better. And as, to, as a United States Senator, I would love to serve and to work hard for the uh, Wisconsin and the people of Wisconsin. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Mr. Tom Nelson to our forum. Uh, Mr. Nelson, we're giving all of our uh, panelists two minutes to give an opening statement and introduction. It just so happens that you are up in the rotation. So you have your two minutes, sir. Great. Well, thank you. I guess in politics, they say it's all about timing. So thank you very much for the, for the invitation. It's good to see everyone. Uh, you had a great dinner last year, very much enjoyed that. And the speaker as well, the keynote speaker, I want to bring up, I hit some of his remarks because uh, they were good and they were so mem memorable. I'm, well, I like to talk about, about they, but my background, uh, so Tom Nelson, I'm the Outagay County Executive. And, um, you know, you're looking for who could beat Ron Johnson. I'm the only one from a red part of the state who won election and re-election six times, three as a legislator and three as a county executive. So if you can get elected in a red part of the state, you can win a purple state. And once I get to Washington, I can do my job. Now, um, just as important as being able to get elected is who you are and what your core is. And for me, my story is a lot like a lot of Wisconsinites, which is I grew up in a blue collar neighborhood. In my case, it was a small town of Little Chute. And on that block, all the dads worked at paper mills, except for my dad. He wore the white collar. He was a little pastor. So I learned twin lessons of that um, the importance of public service, serving your community, as well as, you know, as well as there's a lot of people there that work hard, play by the rules, pay their taxes, but they cannot get ahead because there's too much money and too much power concentrated to few hands. And that's been the story across this state, from the deindustrialization of Milwaukee to losing paper mills in the Fox Valley to losing family farms in Western Wisconsin. And so I have three big parts to my campaign. Number one, economic security. Number two, health security. I'm a huge proponent of Medicare for all and the only candidate here who is running hard on Medicare for all. And finally, a green new deal. What good is a good job in your health if you don't plan it? Climate crisis is an existential crisis. We need a green deal, a green new deal. And here is another difference between myself and the field. I'm the only one campaign on a green new deal and champion, well, unpopular things like opposing line five and line three. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Pektarski, you have two minutes. Well, Lakara was next in the order, but if, if you want me here, fine. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I did. Uh, wait a minute. Um, o comes before P. Okay. Uh, Mr. Olakara, I apologize. <laughs> uh, no, no, no problem at all, Ricky. Thank you. Thank you, NAACP, for hosting this. It's truly an honor to be here. Great to see everyone. My name is Stephen Olakara, running for the U.S. Senate. I'm from Waukesha County, and I'm running to change the system. And my conviction around this kind of new politics is really from my background. I grew up uh, as the son of Indian immigrants. My uh, parents, when they immigrated here, uh, they did not have access to political power. And being an outsider growing up uh, in this area really formed my politics of creating a, an inclusive politics that truly includes everyone. Uh, my other big inspiration in life uh, comes from jazz music. Uh, I know that sounds maybe unexpected to hear at a candidate forum, but if you really want to understand my politics, it really comes from jazz music, playing in jazz groups all across uh, greater Milwaukee and around the state where I really learned about the power of listening, of helping people see their common humanity, and the power of building diverse coalitions. And inspired by that, as well as the Obama campaign, which gave me a shot to introduce uh, the president in front of uh, 30,000 people here in the state, uh, I've decided to found the Millennial Action Project and led that as its CEO for about 10 years. And that became the nation's largest organization of young elected legislators uh, in the country, having successfully passed uh, bills ranging from veterans employment to small business ownership and entrepreneurship uh, to gun violence prevention. So I'm running on having the most federal legislative experience in the race. And despite the fact that we're able to defy the odds in Congress and pass all this legislation, 
I also saw the root issue and why I'm running on changing the system. And that is the fact that money has completely taken it over, that there's deep and legalized bribery in the system. And that's why I'm the only candidate who's committed to getting big money out of politics and have proposed that as my first piece of legislation. So government actually works for us and not the big money special interests. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Pektarski, you have two minutes. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you very much. I'd like to thank President Nicholas and the NAACP for putting on this event. My name is Peter Pekarski. I'm running for the United States Senate because that is what I can do for our country. I am a fourth generation Wisconsinite, uh, born and bred in Milwaukee, graduated from Washington High School. I got a couple of degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, including one in electrical engineering. I have a law degree. Um, my father, and five uncles served our country in World War II. I served as a civilian consultant to the Chief of Naval Operations of the United States Navy on issues of strategic nuclear weapons and platforms and to the Director of Naval Intelligence on matters of intelligence analysis. Uh, I've also been a high-tech uh, intellectual property lawyer, patent, copyright, and trademark in a number of science and and scientific and technical areas uh, for a substantial period of time and that has given me familiarity with a lot of the science and technology relevant to issues being faced by our country and the United States Senate, such as um, universal broadband, sustainable agriculture, doing something to stop climate change, uh, and a number of other issues. Um, I've also been involved in election protection right here in the city of Milwaukee for 20 years. I'm the guy on the ground in the polling place, many of them, like 40 or 50 every election day, making certain that the people in those locations get to vote properly without obstruction. Uh, in 2020, at the request of the Biden campaign during the primaries, the Democratic National Committee, the Democratic Party of Wisconsin and other groups, I donated about 2000 hours of my professional time uh, to a su successful effort to protect the election. I also ran an election software project uh, in the battleground states, which also protected the election and the two elections in Georgia in January of 2021. Look forward to discussing other matters with you further. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Schrader, you're on the clock. Hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me to this forum. Uh, my name is David Schrader, and I'm running for the United States Senate to replace the incumbent Ron Johnson in his party's primary. So I'm the first one up against him, toe to toe. Um, in, in the middle of a COVID pandemic, I stepped up to oppose the incumbent with no financial or formal organizational backing and only the support of a substantial number of my fellow citizens who nominated me to qualify as a legitimate candidate in a major political party to run in this election. I have no financial backing at all. I would like to make that perfectly clear. If I get elected to this seat, I will represent your interests and no, nobody else's. Uh, I've been embarrassed and disgusted to be represented by the man who holds this office for the last 12 years, and I really do want to replace him. If I elected, the fir my first priorities are going to be trying to get uh, the Freedom of the Vote Act and the John Lewis Voters right, R Voter Rights Amendment Act, both already passed by the House but stalled in the Senate, to be passed and made law so that this... This, the, the democracy that we are, is in danger right now can be saved by, by these laws. I also would be in uh, work to uh, nullify the Citizens United decision made by the Supreme Court a few years ago, which took away one, basically took away one person, one vote and replaced it with one dollar, one vote. And uh, again, a disaster for the democracy. And finally, my fourth part, the, the fourth thing I would want to push for there, the, Virginia just became the 38th state to pass the, the Equal Rights Amendment, which means there are enough states to make that the 28th Amendment in, of the Constitution. And I would like to push for that, especially after what's happened recently with the Supreme Court decision on making half of, our, half of the citizens of this country second-class citizens. Again, thank you very much for inviting me for, to participate. Thank you, sir. Last but certainly not least, Mr. Williams, it is your time. Uh, good morning and thank you, Mr. Townsell and Mr. Nicholas for housing and for hosting this uh, event in the NAACP. Um, 
I'm, 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 my name is Dr. Darrell Williams, and I'm running for the United States Senate for a couple of reasons. The education of our kids is key to address veterans' issues, to help bridge the racial divide within this country, restore the trust and confidence between law enforcement and our communities. We really need to bring uh, someone who can bring people together and also job creation. I was born in the cotton fields of Abbeville, Mississippi, a town of about 316 people. I used to pick cotton for about two of a hundred, that's $2 for every hundred pounds of cotton. And that's a lot of cotton. I went to Rush College, Holly Springs, Mississippi, came up here to Wisconsin to teach. My mother raised six kids off of 335 an hour. So you don't have to tell me about the importance of a family supporting wage and union supporting jobs. I know the importance of it because I never had one. But I came here, went on to college. I joined the military when I was 16 years old. Did 20, I served this country for 29 years, two tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, received the Purple Heart and Bronze Star Medal for service in the combat zone. I was a teacher, principal, administrator uh, here in Milwaukee Public Schools for a number of years and interim superintendent of schools in Beloit. I was selected national principal of the year in 2013. And uh, upon uh, return from Afghanistan, I uh, was appointed as emergency manager for the state of Wisconsin by our own Governor Evers. That is the lead state agency that deals with all natural and man-made disasters here within the state and also serves as the heartbeat of the COVID-19 response and civil unrest action here within the state. So I've been on the front lines of these issues that's really most critical to us at this point in time. And I also have the vision to look beyond the tip of my nose and work at the federal level and get us the best results here at the state level as your United States Senate. Thank you, sir. Since we, we're going to move immediately into the questionings, the questions, and since we began the introduction with Lieutenant uh, Governor Barnes, we're going to begin the questions with Mr. Darrell Williams. So Mr. Williams, the first question that we have on board here is, what is your position on the insurrection that occurred in our nation's capital on January 6, 2021? And do you feel it's important to discover and punish the planners as well as the perpetrators? Excellent question. And uh, how, I, I, I'm sickened by the actions of the insurrection at, at the uh, Capitol. And uh, we, can't, we can't address that issue without talking about the, uh, the flip side of that coin because if that had been a whole bunch of black people that had rushed uh, the Capitol, it would be a whole lot of dead black people at that point in time and people would not be held accountable for that. So yes, I do believe that people should be held accountable uh, for, um, for the role that they played in, in that insurrection. And I think that was an eye-opening event for all people and not just looking at it from a matter of black and white, but a matter of what right and wrong with, with this country. And to have one of our own here with uh, uh, a sitting US senator sitting at, the, uh, sitting at the table and maybe on this call here today that was uh, implicated and involved in this, in this whole situation is really an insult to the people here within the uh, state of Wisconsin. And all people need to be held accountable for the role that they played um, in that insurrection. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Schrader. Same question. Thank you. And I would like to amplify what Mr. Williams has just said, uh, specifically in, including the part about when you watch the, the, what happens with that insurrection from a, from a camera uh, on top of the Capitol with the mask coming at it and wondering, you know, if these were black people coming at it, there'd be an awful lot of dead ones laying out there by now. Why isn't that happening now? And then specifically in violation of his oath of office, Senator Johnson volunteered to deliver a list of fraudulent, elect, fraudulent electors to the vice president personally participating in an attempt to overturn a free and fair election by nullifying not just the votes of his, what he, his perceived political opponents, but all of our votes in the state of Wisconsin. Thank you, sir. He personally tried to take away our basic rights to directly choose our representatives and make our participation in the electoral process irrelevant. I think he needs to be replaced. And according to the, the way I read the 14th Amendment, he should be right now removed from office for participating in that and should not be allowed to run for office in the future. Thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Mr. Pekarski. You're muted, sir. You're muted, Mr. Pekarski. We can't hear you. And you, I trust you can hear me now. At least I yes, hope sir. so. Okay. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, the answer is yes, there should be a full investigation and as appropriate prosecution as warranted of each and every person who participated in that event, planned it, incited it, uh, paid for it, had any role in it. That's up to the United States Department of Justice. Um, and it's time for them to do their job. Uh, as far as Senator Johnson is concerned, he broke his oath of office, not only on um, in connection with the events of January 6th, um, but in connection with the second impeachment trial of uh, Donald Trump. In order to be a United States Senator, Senator Johnson had to promise along with every other Senator, just as, uh, Every senator must promise to support the United States Constitution. You have to make that promise or you're not allowed to be a senator. He made that promise. He broke it. And the reason he broke it was at the second impeachment trial, he voted to acquit Donald Trump. There is absolutely no way that he should have voted to acquit somebody who was advocating the murder of the vice president of the United States on national television on the day the electoral votes were being counted. That is my view of what should happen here. That's my view of what Senator Johnson did. Uh, there are other ways in which he has disgraced the office, but you asked about this, we can get into the others. Um, that's gotta happen with respect to all the other people. And I should make clear that Donald Trump, anybody else involved in this should be accorded all of their constitutional rights. And I expect they will be as appropriate uh, in federal court or state court if it's necessary. But there should be an investigation there should be prosecution as, as decided by the impartial prosecutors, and we should proceed with this matter and remove Senator Johnson from office for that reason and a number of others. Thank you, Mr. Pekarski. Mr. Olakara. Thank you. This is one of the most pressing questions facing not just our country right now, but uh, the whole history of our country and where we're going. Uh, we did not have a peaceful transition of power. Uh, political violence is real and it's now on display for everyone. Uh, but certainly this is not the beginning of political violence uh, in our country. And of course the black community has uh, borne the, the worst of the political violence uh, that we've had. What we need to be focused on is why uh, so many people were involved in this effort and why even members of Congress were uh, potentially co-conspirators. Uh, in the insurrection. And so the direct answer to your question, Ricky, is yes, everyone involved should be held accountable, not only the people uh, on the outside trying to get inside uh, to the Capitol, but people who are on the inside uh, from the beginning. Everyone should be held accountable uh, who is involved in this. And the reason why is because this idea of democracy is extremely precious. And we're at risk of losing it if we don't address the underlying issues before we get to uh, 2024. Uh, on top of that, we need to address the systemic forces here, why it's become so profitable uh, for politicians and the political establishment to be sowing division, to be sowing hate, and now since 2020, uh, sowing doubt in our electoral systems in terms of denying the 2020 uh, election. Have you ever wondered, for everyone who's tuning in right now, why you see people who at one point might feel or seem perfectly reasonable but now are completely denying the 2020 election. People who were never Trumpers are now running for office, trying to uh, cling on to Trump as much as possible. Uh, that's because of the incentives and the money and the primary system, and we have to change that. And of course, one of the people at the pinnacle of this broken system is Ron Johnson, and that's what I'm running to replace him. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lacara. Mr. Lee, your opinion, sir. I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson. All right, thank you. <clears throat> of course, thank you for the question. I wanna make two points. Number one, Ron Johnson should go to jail. And number two, what should we do after the January 6th committee? First of all, I was the first candidate up here to call on Ron Johnson to resign. I did that January 7th of 2021. And I did that before the Lieutenant Governor did. Let's correct that falsehood. Number two, I called for him six months ago, six months ago for the January 6th committee to subpoena him. And it turns out what we've learned, not only did he gin up this, res this insurrection by 
abusing his position on the Homeland Security Committee, but he actually passed along a slate of fake electors. So after I called for him to resign back in January 2021, in February of 2021, one month later, I put a, I put a billboard a billboard outside his house on Highway 41 accusing him of committing treason. He was controversial at the time, but there's a lot of people now who are nodding their says, yeah, yeah, maybe he was up to something. So that's number two. Um, and regardless of what happens with the January 6th committee, Ron Johnson should be prosecuted to the full extent of law. I'm not sure what the final conclusion is going to be from the January 6th committee, but at the very least, we need to make sure that our U.S. Senator is held accountable and I can't see any scenario where, where, where he does not or should not go to prison. Finally, what to do after, after the January 6th committee. This has been bombshell after bombshell. And the more we learn about it, we realize just how close we came to um, you know, elected officials being assassinated, violence well beyond what we thought. And you know, there are people talking about how it's just a matter of time before this happens again. So we need to make sure that a message is sent and everyone, everyone responsible, for the January 6th insurrection is held accountable. The message has to be crystal clear. Anyone think about doing anything like that again will suffer those same consequences. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, Mr. Lee. Thank you, Ricky. You know, this is, this is very sad uh, in particular because my family, we, we ran away for a, from a very authoritarian, a communist uh, a country in Laos to, to get here in the United States and to witness what we saw on January 6th. It's very uh, scary. It's very, uh, not very healthy for democracy. And to me, the constitution is the most important thing that guards and protects our democracy, our freedom. And when we have people that are sworn to protect the very words of the constitution who turns around and betray the very words, I think that they should be punished to the extent, to the fullest extent of the law. And this is an example of how we need to protect our democracy because when we don't, we uh, it's not free and it's not an entitlement. So every time we have a debate where we go from this point, I think it falls back to the American public, Wisconsinites. You have the power in your hand to elect people that you think that could trust to represent you. My campaign, it's all 100% grassroots. I didn't come from money. I'm not a politician. I grew up both poor and poverty. And I also feel a little bit privileged living in Northeast Wisconsin right now. And I understand the struggles. And we need real people with some sort of humanity to do this job right. And so this is just a perfect example of what can we can lose. So we must protect democracy at all costs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lazary. Yeah, you know, look, I think, you know, as everyone said, this was a seminal moment in our history. Um, and what happened on January 6th was an attack on the U.S. Capitol, an attempt to overthrow the government of the United States of America. This was an attempt to overthrow the government and overthrow our election. And Johnson himself has admitted that he played a role in trying to overthrow the government and he played a role in uh, making sure that he tried to uh, stop a, uh, a free and fair election. And when you do stuff like that, you know, that's seditious. You know, that's being a traitor to your country. And that's something that um, the people of Wisconsin don't deserve and why we need better representation. And, you know, I think when you look at all the things that Ron Johnson has done and all the things he hasn't done, quite frankly, we can actually see that Ron Johnson is more focused on overturning an election than he is to bring jobs and investment to this state. And that's one of the biggest problems we have is that right now we've got a senator who cares more about trying to overthrow an election, who cares more about um, uh, you know, bringing false electors to, uh, um, to, to try to stop Joe Biden from becoming president, rather than actually working and doing his job to bring jobs and investment to this state. Uh, and so you know, that's something that I wanna make sure that we change, that we've got to hold Ron Johnson accountable. And the best way to do that is by voting him out in November. Um, if we wanna show 
uh, the people of this country um, and the people of the state that these type of politics don't work. Um, we've got to vote them out in November, and um, that's why uh, that's why I'm running. Thank you, sir. And like again, finally but not least, Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Well, thank you so much for the question. I'll tell you, when it was revealed that Ron Johnson's office tried to overturn a free and fair election, he essentially looked every person in this state, every person in this country in the eye and told them that their vote doesn't matter. That's unacceptable. And that's exactly why I called on him to resign. And the insurrection and the attempt to overthrow our democracy showed us just how vulnerable our democracy is. And we already had known how sympathetic Ron Johnson had been to insurrectionists. So we shouldn't be surprised. And that's why this election is so important, even though we've called for him to resign. It's not like he's gonna step down because we told because we told him to. He's gonna have to step down when we beat him this November. Now the window to save our democracy is closing. And that's the point I wanna leave people with. We absolutely have to act now. And that is why the very first plan that my campaign released is a plan to protect our democracy and to hold all of our elected leaders accountable, whether it's the Supreme Court or whether it's members of Congress. And that's something I'm incredibly proud to be endorsed by so many leaders in Washington who are fighting every day to protect our democracy. People like Senator Cory Booker, who's gonna be in Milwaukee next week, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Majority Whip Jim Clyburn, and of course our own Congresswoman Gwen Moore, who's been in this fight for a long time and who's been a mentor to me. Now, I believe that we can expand our democratic majority in the Senate and protect our democracy, but we can only do this if we come together, if we organize and we turn out the vote in every community and higher numbers than we ever have before. And this is a fight that I know the NAACP has been involved with for a long time, registering voters in communities that get left behind, making sure people know just how important their voice is. I know this because I've done this work with you all and I continue to do this work alongside the NAACP. And I'm hoping that we can expand the scope of that work together uh, after, uh, the United, after I'm elected to the United States Senate. Thank you, sir. We'll begin our second question with Mr. Schrader. The question is, if elected to the US Senate, will you vote to advance the John Lewis Voting Rights Act? And if not, why? I've, why already, are... <laughs> I've already answered that question and that is exactly my first priority is to pass that, that piece of legislation along with the Voter uh, uh, Freedom to Vote Act and again, to, to nullify the, the uh, um, <laughs> excuse me, the Citizens United decision passed by, the, or passed by the Supreme Court a few years ago. If we don't pass those two pieces of legislation, this country is going to be in deep trouble. Uh, the gerrymandering that has gone in, on in this state since 2010 has made this state not a democracy by any, any stretch of the imagination. When you have 66% of the state legislature only representing 44% of the population and 56% of the population being represented by 33% of the state legislature, I defy you to find me a definition of democracy that would include something like that. So yes, I am completely, again, that would be my first priority which would be to get those two pieces of legislation unstalled in the US Senate. And if it takes overturning the filibuster to do it, I would vote for that as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Olakara, you're next, sir. Yes, because voting rights is the essential piece of our democracy. You know, I've had a few conversations with John Lewis over the years, and, and one thing he always emphasized to me was uh, the vote is the most powerful nonviolent tool that we have for social change in our country. And I know a lot of people who are tuning in right now might feel like our politics and our institutions and Congress have completely failed us and might even ask the reasonable question, you know, why should we vote if voting doesn't change our daily reality? And I think the answer is that both things can be true at the same time. You know, while our politics have failed us and while we haven't had real benefits and resources coming to our most uh, challenging and vulnerable and impoverished communities, at the same time, what John Lewis said is absolutely true too, that voting is one of the most powerful ways uh, to change that reality. And we, knew, we know that one of the most impactful reforms there that I've been most passionate about over the years is automatic voter registration. 
which basically says that when you go into, say, get your driver's license, you're automatically registered to vote. We know there's a long history in our country of our uh, politics trying to deny people the ability to even register uh, to vote. I'm proud to be the only candidate who's running right now who's been directly involved in passing uh, automatic voter registration laws across the country by getting not only Democratic, but also Republican support. And uh, some of the states were able to pass this law. Uh, it would not have passed unless we had that bipartisan support. So the difference between talking about this issue and passing it is having a leader who's capable of building those diverse coalitions in that jazz spirit that I was talking about earlier, of openness and empathy and and humanity, uh, that's what allows you to build these coalitions and make arguments that are going to resonate with a uh, diverse coalition of people. So I want to simply scale up that work that I've already successfully done at the state level up to the federal level and pass that legislation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Pekarski? Yes, I, I trust you can hear me this time. Yes, yes. Sir. The, the question was, will I vote to advance the John Lewis Voting Rights Act? I will definitely vote to advance the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. I had the privilege of thanking John Lewis personally for what he has done for our country. Unfortunately, he's left us. He's a remarkable man. He put his life on the line for this country a long time ago and got his head split open. And thank goodness he survived um, to serve for many years in the Congress. There are a lot of things that have to be done, um, which thankfully generally don't involve putting your life on the line to make certain that we have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And for the people means doing for the people what they want done for them, not necessarily for what the top half percent or one percent of people in wealth in this country want done for them or to preserve their wealth or their standing. Um, I can refer you to my website for some of the things I'm doing in in court right now, I mentioned the election software project I ran in 2020 uh, to make certain that something very necessary happens. It is necessary. The NAACP, get out the vote groups, devote a lot of effort to making sure a lot of people vote and put those votes in the ballot box. That is absolutely necessary. You know, I'd like you know to congratulate and encourage all the people who do that, all the people who register voters. The other thing that has to be done is those votes have to be counted as cast. Uh, unfortunately, the party sometimes pays very little attention to that. I pay a lot of attention to it. I'm in court right now with two cases. You can look, look at my website, pekarskiforwisconsin.com. Under the legal notices section, you'll see the complaints. It's more than I can discuss in 14 seconds, but take a look at them. Have any questions, please send them in. Uh, and I will look forward to your support and to your continuing to vote and get your votes counted as cast. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lee, I'm sorry, Mr. Nelson, I keep getting out of, Mr. Nelson. Okay, that's okay, thank you for the question. Well, not only do I support the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, I think we need to take it a step further and pass the For the People Act because that covers two together, um, will go a long way in covering a number of issues. And of course, For the People Act, it deals with, with uh, gerrymandering. And there are very few states that have more at stake than passing federal legislation that will do something about gerrymandering. And not only do we have to do those two pieces of legislation, we need to work to repeal Citizens United. Because even if we were to pass some of the campaign finance reform ideas that have been talked about, well, if it's not constitutional, then it's going to be struck down eventually. And the only way to get rid of Citizens United is to remake the court. And the only way to remake the court is to add seats, is to expand the court. The only people who are going to expand the court are Democrats in a Democratic majority. So you do that by winning the U.S. Senate seat in Wisconsin because this will determine control of the U.S. Senate. And then once you get to Washington, you don't blink, you don't come up with excuses, you get rid of the filibuster. And by the way, if we would have gotten rid of the filibuster, the racist filibuster decades ago, if we would have gotten rid of it a long time ago, we would not have had to wait to the 1960s to get civil rights reform. Think about that. So we should have learned our lesson back in the 1960s. We are really hurt now. One half of the population, women, have had a fundamental right taken away from them. And in order to do, do any of this, we have got to nominate the strongest candidate possible. I'm the only one from a red part of the state who's won election, re-election six times. Three is a legislator and three is a county executive. 
Democrats cannot mess this up. We have to nominate the strongest candidate and the kind of candidate that's going to embody the values that are going to go to Washington to champion issues like getting rid of the filibuster, expanding the court, and protecting voting rights, among much, much more. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lee? Thank you, Ricky. You know, in the spirit of John Lewis, you know, I will support better access to increasing the number of poll stations, drop boxes. You know, we have to allow early votings, expand our expanded hours, all in all reducing the, uh, you know, the waiting lines for Americans to, to vote and to actually make it easier for the full poll workers. But this is what I have to say though. You know, it's very sad because just as of two days ago, Wisconsin just banned uh, the use of uh, drop boxes. That's a form of voter suppression right there. But I'm gonna say this to you guys, that we cannot have voting rights unless we have a fair election process. You ask the folks on the panel today, with all the money that we have, who is financing your campaign? Because the problem that I see with every uh, political elected officials is the fact that they don't answer to you. They do not answer to the Wisconsin Knights. They answer to this big money, to all these brand name endorsements. So I worry about that. My campaign in particular is 100% grassroots. We don't have any big donors from corporations. We don't have any political powers backing us a campaign. And I'm happy because I'm telling you that I'm gonna have 100%, 10% autonomy to make decision and the freedom to listen to you and to answer to you. So we cannot have voting rights unless we have a fair election process. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lazary, you're on the clock. Yeah, I, I'm for passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. I wanna pass anything that's gonna make it easier for people to vote. You know, what we're seeing right now from Republicans across the country and uh, you know, and Republicans in state Supreme Courts and in, uh, in the US Supreme Court is their, their want and need to make it harder for people to vote. And that's just not what this country is based off of. Um, this country is founded and based off of having democratic participation, having citizens being able to participate in, in their elections. It's the only way we can make sure that our politicians are accountable to, uh, to the voters is making it easier for people to vote so that more so that it's um, so that we have as many people voting as possible. And that's why I also agree with getting rid of the filibuster. We need to make sure that we get rid of the filibuster <clears throat> so that we can pass legislation that makes it easier for for everyone to vote uh, in this country. Thank you, sir. Um, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Mia. Uh, All right. Well, Thank you so much for that question. And again, we know that we have to protect the right to vote with everything that we have. And I mentioned the fact that the first policy plan of my campaign was one to protect democracy and the right to vote that starts in the filibuster and passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to crack down on voter suppression efforts. And I'm glad uh, Kuali mentioned uh, them getting rid of ballot drop boxes. It is absolutely a form of voter suppression. And I remember uh, my first time working with so many of you all was in 2011 when they introduced the voter ID bill and here in Wisconsin. And one of the things we did is we hit the ground running. We went straight into communities. We pulled a list of eligible voters who may not have an ID. And along with the NAACP and many organizations, we went door to door to try to make sure that everybody was ready to vote in the next election. Now, as we know, it does not end there with the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. We have to do the work now to expand the right to vote by expanding mail-in voting options, online voter registration, and same-day voter registration, which we are fortunate to have here. But that's how we know we need to do the work to protect it, because they will try to take it away. And then we also have to be sure to build an election, uh, build the election infrastructure, I should say, to cut down on long lines that discourage people from voting. And we also have to get big money out of politics. I am the only candidate who has been endorsed by In Citizens United because of my pledge to get big money out of politics. Last uh, June, we had an average donation of $35. That's what powered this campaign. Everyday people, this is a priority of mine. And it's hard to believe that we're still here having the same fights that our families 
and all of our communities had generations ago, whether it's in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or whether it was in Selma, Alabama, whether it's protecting the right to vote or a woman's right to choose. That goes to show just how important this election is in November and how fragile our democracy is. The fact that they don't want to vote is the reason that we need to show up in uh, historic numbers. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Williams, you'll have the opportunity to answer last. Thanks for that question. And uh, yes, I, I, I definitely would support the uh, John, uh, passing of the John Lewis uh, Voting Acts. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet him as well. And, but he also added the, the importance of action and courage. Every one of us here have said in, uh, how important it is that we make sure that our people are informed, that we uh, get the population out, the democracy is precious to the people, you know, how uh, the, uh, taking away the ballot box is a form of voter suppression. But it also takes courage on our parts as well, because the other form of voter suppression that's right before us right now is what WTMJ4 is doing to the candidates and the people of Wisconsin right now in front of our very eyes. And there are, and there are not many people who are standing uh, up for the people of Wisconsin as we speak. As you all know, the uh, televised debate uh, that's coming up with WTMJ4, they have put criteria in place that will prevent many of us who you see right here from being on the televised stage this is the, a direct form of voter suppression by not allowing the people who they're being asked to vote for to even see or hear the voices of those who, who, who are at the who are on the ballot. So this is very important. So this will test the courage of everybody who sits up here and says how important it is to be at the table and the voices of the people because all candidates should be able to stand together as one if they're truly for the people and say, look, we should, people of Wisconsin should hear all the voices of the people. And anybody who participates in that debate without here having all the voices at the table is really supporting the very form of voter suppression that we swear that we are against. So this is important. So it's one thing to sit up here and say things to the people, but it's another one to have the courage and to take action and, um, you know, at the cost, leadership costs. And this is what it takes. And this is what I bring to the table as your next United States Senate. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Olacaro, you'll have the opportunity to answer our third question first. And that question is, what would you propose or what plan would you support to relieve inflation and the rising gas prices that is hurting Wisconsin citizens? Yeah, great question. Thank you, Ricky, because what's happening with inflation and gas prices is the effectively a regressive tax. Uh, it's regressively uh, impacting our communities with a disproportionate impact on low income communities. And that's why any politician that's missing in action on this issue, Democrat or Republican, uh, is enabling uh, uh, these oppressive economic systems. And so we got to take this head on. And I hope as you hear my answer on this, you, you can tell that I'm a little bit more independent uh, minded on, on these issues. Uh, one of the biggest drivers of inflation right now and, and gas prices is uh, what happened during the pandemic. We had major disruptions uh, to the supply chain system where you had demand rapidly changing on certain areas, uh, supply chains uh, being disrupted as well, not only with our international ports, but also here uh, domestically. Uh, so I want to take on this issue head on by further investing in uh, opening up our ports, uh, addressing some of the bottlenecks, and also uh, helping to support our president on using the Defense Production Act to be uh, opening up uh, things like our oil refineries so that they can increase production to pre-pandemic levels. Now, one of the issues that's underneath the surface here is why aren't we seeing more people working together to reduce these issues? Too often, I'm sure you all see this when you watch the news, there's a much greater incentive to be finger pointing and saying it's the other person's problem instead of working together to solve the problem, which to many of us sounds like common sense, but that's in short supply in Congress because again, this is why I'm working on changing the system. There's a much greater incentive to simply demonize people and put out tweets than actually to work collaboratively on legislation that's going to help you. And that's why I'm gonna take on this problem firsthand. And one of my proposals there is to ban members from fundraising while Congress is in session. So they're focused on legislating for you as opposed to fundraising from their donors all the time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Pekarsky, the same question. 
Thank you very much. The question was, what, am I, what legislation am I willing to support to relieve inflation? Uh, I'm willing to support, consider and support any, legisl any legislation that would do that. Realistically, we all have to realize that there is no button that the President of the United States, for example, can push or the Congress can push to relieve or reduce inflation. Yeah, there are some things on the fringes the President could do to a limited extent with the uh, National Petroleum Reserve or Strategic Petroleum Reserve, but these forces were set in place, as Mr. Olicara just mentioned, when $4.5 trillion of our money was taken to make the world safe for junk bond investors in March and April of 2020. That money went into the market. When they got done buying stocks or ran out of stocks to buy, it went into commodities, drove up the prices of those commodities, which means, for example, wheat, which goes into the bread you buy at the, gro at the grocery store, that drove up prices. What is going on, on, on now in Ukraine, and the it's a total tragedy. On the economic side, it's also interrupting the uh, um, petroleum markets, which is driving up prices. So I'm willing to consider anything. Uh, part, of the, part of this is because that 4.5 trillion went to the top people in this country, instead of going to support the ordinary working people in this country as the Europeans did. And that ties right into what Dr. Williams just mentioned about the TMJ debate. There are five people who are gonna be on that stage for an hour. The question is, and that's a corporation that's doing it. Corporation owns the TV station. This is a corporate contribution. The amount of that contribution, that is if you wanna buy an hour of airtime on TV4, you can do it for $600,000. The cost is $5,000 per 30 second. In an hour, there are 120 of them. That's $600,000. Divide by, divide by five, that's effectively, and I'm not saying there's anything illegal going on here, I'm not addressing that issue, just when you work it out, you want to buy that time, you can buy it for $120,000 for every person on that stage. Uh, and the other three aren't being allowed to say anything. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nelson. All right, thank you. I wanna make three points. First of all, inflation, what it is, number one. Number two, what it's not, and number three, how a national industrial strategy is gonna solve this. First of all, what it is now. Republicans say that's increased government spending, specifically COVID money spending. That's not true because there was debate about a COVID related bill that was prorated about $100 billion a year. Compare that to the defense authorization bill, $700 billion that all the Republicans voted for, okay? So that's not it. And if anything, they're driving the inflation with that and people like Ron Johnson are voting for it, so we should get rid of him. What it is and the solutions. What we need to know is, you know, corporations are making profits hand over fist. And the reason why people are feeling pain and pump is because the oil company is reaping record profits. So we need a windfall profits tax, those proceeds and gave it to the motors and the families that are being hurt by that. Number two, we have to rebuild our supply chain that's put us at the mercy of uh, like, uh, for, uh, foreign, foreign, foreign competitors that, that's also driving inflation because we cannot meet market demand because we don't make key products like microchips. Number three, we have to close corporate tax loopholes. That's connected to the windfall to prop profits tax. We need to enforce antitrust and anti-monopoly because that's giving corporate consolidation out of control. And we need to renegotiate trade deals. All those things together conspire to create inflation and a lot of other problems. The solution is a national industrial strategy. It takes all those issues under one roof. It renegotiates trade deals from the perspective of the worker, fair taxation for corporate America, and on, on, on making sure that we do everything we can to reverse the deindustrialization of a manufacturing state like Wisconsin, which has killed, which has killed jobs in cities like Milwaukee, like Madison, in addition to paid places like the Fox River Valley. We have focused on those things. We're focusing on the root causes and we will take care of inflation both in the short term and the long term. Thank you. Mr. Lee. Thank you, Ricky. This is a, a wonderful question. And, and I think as Americans, as Wisconsinites, we have to uh, uh, understand that this is more of a, of a symptom and it's not the actual cause of the problem. If you look at closely at the situation that we're facing and understand so many families here in Wisconsin struggle because of the gas prices, because of you know food prices and everything else went up. And I think that as uh, political figures and leaders of our country, we could, done, we could have done something to help along the way. 
But in this case, I think a lot of it has to do with corporate greed. And I know that uh, Mr. Nelson mentioned the windfall tax, which is our idea from the Lee campaign, that I proposed the idea that um, all these big corporations are making billions in profits. These money were not uh, shared with the public or the consumers, or yet they're not putting this money into investments, into their capital investments, human capital uh, investments, or any innovation so that they can improve the process and also improve the lives of our people. Uh, that's what I was proposing that we do. But at the same token, what we have seen is that all the wealth has kind of shifted from bottom to top. And what you see is this corporate greed, human greed. And so that's why we're having this issue. That's why in the last two years, when you read and when you look around the country, we produce millionaires become multimillionaires and multimillionaires become billionaires and so forth. And the rest of the Americans, 80% of us suffer because of the pandemic, but yet the wealthy are just getting richer. And so I think as a United States Senator, we had to re-examine the antitrust laws to make sure the monopolies and oligopolies doesn't happen in the sector so that we could uh, create competitions, a more viable middle class for Americans. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Lazary. Yeah, thank you, Ricky. I mean, I think this is one of the most important questions that, uh, that we're dealing with this in this campaign. And it's one that I've continuously talked about. Um, I've released plans on both putting more money into working people's pockets and on easing supply chain problems, while also lowering inflationary pressures and helping create more jobs in, in every part of the state. And, you know, that's something I've done my entire career. And I think if we want to make sure that um, we're easing uh, gas prices, you know, we've called for a uh, um, for a federal hot for a gas tax holiday, we've called for ensuring that we bring back the worker tax deductions that um, that the Trump tax cuts took away. Um, used to be able to uh, deduct uh, gas mileage um, to and from work, and the Trump tax cuts took that away. And you know what a lot of economists also say is that one of the best ways we can ease inflationary pressures is to repeal the Trump tax cuts. And so you know I think that's one of the first things we would do. We also have to think about how we're going to deal with inflation in the long term and supply chains in the long term. And one of the best ways we can do that is to make sure that we're bringing more jobs, more manufacturing jobs back here to the United States. Uh, and so we've put out plans to incentivize companies to bring their manufacturing operations back here. We need to invest more in our education and workforce training to make sure that we continue to have uh, the best trained workers and to make sure that we have uh, the best job pool. We've got to uh, fix our immigration system so that we can continue to bring workers in who are going to be able to uh, help grow our economy. There's a lot that we can do in the short term and the long term. Unfortunately, we've got Republicans like Ron Johnson who have no interest in doing anything and who have actively worked uh, to raise prices and raise taxes on the middle class. If we're able to get rid of Ron Johnson and make sure that we can give Tammy Baldwin a real partner in D.C., we can make sure that our economy is working for everyone and that we can mitigate the inflationary pressures right now while also making sure uh, that we don't have these problems in the future. Thank you, sir. Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Thank you so much. Now, I'll tell you, uh, as I mentioned in my intro, my path here is a little bit different. Don't come from a wealthy family. And with that being said, I know exactly what it's like to struggle to pay bills or wonder how you'll make ends meet. And that's exactly why we need to give middle class families some relief in the form of a tax cut. We can pay for it by making sure that the wealthiest people among us pay their fair share. Americans need a raise, especially in our community. A minimum wage has gone up federally since 2009. We have to raise minimum wage and also lower the cost of everyday necessities. And I guarantee you, we can do it. But I'll tell you, it's time for us to crack down on oil and drug companies because they're using inflation as a smoke screen to raise prices on the American people. These companies are making record profit and also support a federal gas tax holiday to give people some immediate relief. And we should also follow it up with increased investments in renewable energy right here at home so we're not so reliant on fossil fuels. And we also have to bring manufacturing back home. I wouldn't be here on the stage today if it weren't for American manufacturing. My granddad worked at A.O. Smith for three decades. My dad worked on the assembly line at uh, Delphi in Oak Creek for three decades. When we make things here at home, we don't have to worry about the global supply chain shortages that drive up prices. And we also create good paying union jobs like the one that my dad and my granddad had in the process. 
the bottom line is that we need elected leaders who actually understand what's going on, not just uh, reading the news or reading a study, people who actually experience life in the shoes of the average person in this country. I understand the struggles of people in all communities across Wisconsin because they are my struggles too. And that's how you know that I'll give everything I have in me to fight for you in Washington. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Williams. Hey, thanks for the, thanks for that question and uh, the excellent one. Uh, you know, it, it's it's no doubt that the people we we are very much aware that uh, many of the reasons why th these things have not changed is because people are making money hand over fist. Greed is 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 huge among some of these big uh, drug uh, companies and so forth. And we have got to be unafraid and unapologetic and having conversations with them to try to address these issues for the rest of us. Within, within this society, especially people who come from black and brown communities uh, communities, and also poor white areas up in around Wisconsin. It's key, you know, but I also think it's important that, um, you know, while I support Ukraine and so forth, we have got to look at how we're using some, uh, some of the money, uh, divert some of the money that we're spending elsewhere around the United States and some of these other, uh, uh, countries right, and invest, reinvest right back here uh, and reinvest in our own people right here within the um, uh, United States and the state of Wisconsin. But it also takes us being able to have some good relationships with some of these people, some things that have been torn down with uh, 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 President Trump and run, uh, within the, uh, as president and, and Ron Johnson here within the state of Wisconsin. So those things uh, are very key. We got to reinvest inside our education system, make sure that we have uh, uh, make sure that we're better preparing our kids with entrepreneurial opportunities and jobs and so forth, but also those opportunities to create for themselves. But we cannot forget about our population that is in our prisons as, as well as the voter suppression that's happening to them and they're not being allowed to vote. So we have to make sure that they their rights are not being violated just because they're incarcerated. If they're not convicted of a felony, they should be allowed to vote. And uh, uh, while they're in prison, they're doing a lot of work for us outside of the system. So surely whenever they get out, we should be able to allow them uh, to vote and have the vo uh, their votes count as well. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Mr. Schrader, you'll have the final say on this question. Thank you. Uh, there are basically four causes of inflation, strong demand, supply chain issues, record of raw material shortages, worker shortages, and the previous speakers have pretty well covered the first three. The strong demand has been pretty much debunked by Mr. Nelson. Several people have mentioned the, the uh, record profits by the oil companies and by other companies, large multinational corporations, as far as the supply chain issues go. Uh, I'd like to focus on the, on the worker shortages. Uh, we've had 1.1 million and counting people die from a COVID epidemic that is still going on and seems to be being ignored by everybody. That's leaving an awful lot of positions open to be filled. And we have thousands and thousands of people below south of the, of the U.S. border that are trying to get in, into this country legally. And it's stopped by these racist comments about th them being rapists and murderers and things like that. We need to pass comprehensive immigration reform now so that as traditionally has been the case for this country since it was founded, whenever there's been a labor shortage, we've opened up the borders and let immigrants come in and take those jobs. Now those jobs are not gonna be jobs that anybody in this country traditionally wants to take. I've picked strawberries. I've worked in brickyards. I've picked fruit. I've roofed houses. And I guarantee you that there are people here now that are not interested in taking those low rate wage jobs. We need people to work in restaurants. Restaurants are closing because you can't find people to work in them. So I think we need to, to, to let me, we need to focus on all four of those causes, but I'm, I'm just bringing up the fact that we, we do have ways to stop the worker shortage problem. We're just not using them. And I would also like to make this comment. August 9th is the first time you have to dance after Ron Johnson, not November 8th. Thank you, Mr. Schrader. Mr. Pekarski, you have the privilege of being first on the clock for question number four. Do you support the Affordable Wage Act and raising the federal minimum wage to $17 an hour? And if not, why? 
Yes, I, I support, uh, the, to the extent the Affordable Wage Act wages, raises the minimum wage to $17 an hour, I support it. And I go much farther than that. Um, I, I am not, at least one of the people in this campaign has said that if, we, if companies pay uh, $20 an hour um, to their workers, that's an affordable wage. And the companies kind of hold on to the roughly one point, I guess, $9 trillion tax cut that Donald Trump and the Republicans put through. $20 an hour is not a, work, a living wage in this country today. If you're working 2000, you know, 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, you're working 2000 hours at $20 an hour, you're getting $40,000. And to try and support uh, two parents and two kids in this country on $40,000 a year is probably real close to impossible. I'm not gonna work out in the middle of a Senate campaign exactly what the minimum wage should be. But yes, I will vote for $17 an hour and I will vote and advocate for much more than that. We ought to, if we can make $4.5 trillion available to make the junk bonds, the, the people who invest in junk bonds safe, to make the world safe for junk bond investors, back in the, when that pandemic started in March of 2020, we can afford to somehow work out to get a minimum wage in this country far in excess of 17 or $20 an hour. Exactly what it is, is not clear, but we've got the money to do that. It probably involves rearranging the tax code and collecting a fair amount of taxes from the people at the upper end of the scale and the corporations who aren't contributing a dime uh, to, protect, to, to, to protecting this country, to developing the infrastructure of this country, which makes their profits and their operations and their trucking and flying all over this country possible. So yes, the answer, yes, I will support 17 and I support a lot more than that. And I urge all of my colleagues to do the same. Nelson, same question. I'm muted, sorry. Sir. Is, is Stephen like supposed to, to repeat the question? No, 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 Stephen, is Stephen Alicara, does he go next after? Um, we're, well, Mr. Pekarski went uh, first, and you would be next in alphabetical order. Okay. So. All right. Well, first of all, to answer the question, you guys on that particular piece of legislation, but I want to make three points. Number one, I want to talk about the root cause of our economic problems. Number two, labor rights and labor reform. And finally, health care reform. First of all, um, yes, this would go a long way in raising wages, upward pressure there, but there's more to root problem, including I talked about this before, um, um, renegotiating our trade deals, which have been done on the perspective of corporate America. And so workers never really benefit. In fact, Wisconsin, we lost net 70 thousand jobs since NAFTA was implemented back in 1994. We also have to enforce antitrust laws, anti-monopoly laws in order to get corporate America under control on the front end, which is also bad for consumers and killing jobs. And then on the back end, making sure that they are taxed appropriately, raising taxes for the rich and closing the corporate tax loopholes. So that's the root of that problem, in addition to solving with raising the minimum wage. Second of all, labor rights. The one proven method for raising uh, um, um, the lot of working families um, here, both in Wisconsin and across the country, has been labor unions. What we need to do is in 1947 was began to decline the American labor movement. That's when Taft-Hartley was passed. We need to repeal Taft-Hartley. We also need to go back in the 1930s and reopen up the uh, Wagner Act, the WAG Act, which foundation for collective bargaining issue with that is um, inherently racist because it, it exempts, um, you know, uh, lines profession like domestic workers and agricultural workers um, who have been, um, who do not have those same protections. And finally, healthcare. We need to have Medicare for all. We have to have health security. Health security and economic security go hand in hand. We don't have that and that's what we need to do. And finally, and by the way, all three of those approaches would have a transformative, a transformative effect on communities of color. Mr. Lee, you're next on the clock. Thank you, Ricky. Um, you know, I'm a small business owner and, and I understand the, the struggles that we, we face uh, in this time with uh, labor shortage, um, also the, the cost of labor, 
and the cost to operate and run a business. Uh, not only on that side of the equation, also uh, being a father, uh, you know, my parents, my uh, brothers who, who worked regular jobs and people could feel the pinch in, in this entirety during this process. Um, but we have to understand that um, there are things that we can do to help the American family. And I am all about the American family. Uh, for one, we can increase tax credits for those people, for our people. Uh, but the idea that we're raising wages, I think they're, it's, it's good, but there, we have to be careful because we have to look on both sides of the equation. For a small business like mine, and for the many thousands of family-owned businesses across the state, to pay somebody at 17 or 20 uh, will be very difficult. Even um, uh, uh, Alex Lazarus family could only afford 15. Uh, so I don't have enough data to be uh, confirming whether or not we should approve it, we should make it more, we should make it less. But I, uh, I do agree that um, uh, some of the aspects when it's impacting, like for example, the restaurant industry, we have a record hired by Amazon the last year over 800,000 people. And I think that has contributed a little bit or more or less to the cost of labor shortage in certain industry. So that falls back into this idea of oligopoly and monopoly that we have to be very cautious as elected officials. Um, so that's where I think we should focus on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lazary, you're on the clock. Thanks, Ricky. And, you know, this is something that's been really important to our campaign, making sure that we are raising wages um, in uh, in this country and especially in this state. You know, one of the reasons I think we've you know seen over the last you know 10 years since Ron Johnson's been in office is the fact that you know, if you look at the census data, you know, we've grown at half the national average, which means that you know, right now Wisconsin's best export is its people. And one of those reasons is because um, we still have, uh, you know, the state of Wisconsin's minimum wage is still $7.25. We've got to make sure that we're raising those wages so that we can make sure that um, people are able to, you know, work a good job and, uh, uh, and support their family. And that's why I'm proud uh, to, you know, have made sure that we've raised wages in this state and we've led on that fight. Uh, and it's also why we're so big on making sure that, you know, we're, we're, we're investing in, uh, in union rights, right? Making sure that we pass things like the PRO Act to ensure that labor is, has the ability to negotiate their wages and negotiate um, what they need um, with their employers is, uh, uh, is extremely important to, to ensuring that wages are going to be raised. Because if we want to make sure that everyone's going to be able to you know, have, the, uh, uh, have the ability to succeed, we've got to make sure that people are able to have a, a good paying job with good benefits. And that's why we've also made sure in our plans to uh, work on incentivizing companies to pay a living wage. Um, we've, we've offered and said that we'd have no problem uh, trying to make sure that we're giving uh, incentives for companies to pay you know, 25, 30, 40 bucks an hour. Um, and if we're making sure that we're investing in those type of, uh, uh, in those type of work, um, in, those type of, um, in that type of education, um, that's how I think we can make sure that everyone in this, uh, in this state has access to a good paying job with good benefits. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Barnes, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Sorry, just coming off mute here. So absolutely, I'll tell you, I've been fighting for an increased minimum wage for years. Back when people told us $15 was a joke. Uh, back when that was the word coming from a lot of Democrats, when I was on the back of a pickup truck at the first Fight for 15 rally outside the Grand Avenue Mall in 2014. Now, we need at least a $15 minimum wage for everybody. But the most important thing we have to do is tie the minimum wage to inflation. That's how we get to the point where you're talking about the fact that minimum wage hasn't kept up with inflation is why things are so bad now. It's why income inequality has continued to balloon. Now, this is also how we make sure that people have fair wages. We also hold large corporations, companies, employers accountable, even in times of economic uncertainty, like the one that we're in right now. I'm running for the U.S. Senate to rebuild the middle class and raising wages for American workers is the probably one of the most important parts of that mission. Again, when my granddad moved to Milwaukee after World War II, it was the best place 
for a black family because of the job opportunities, not just any kind of job, family sustaining jobs. And that's what American manufacturing provided. His job built a solid foundation for my family. And my dad, mom and my dad, their good paying union jobs gave us a ticket to the middle class. That modest middle income was enough to make the difference for me where there were so many challenges uh, that surrounded us. Now, unfortunately, those paths, those entry points even to the middle class have been closed off of far too many people in the same exact community where A.O. Smith once stood. And that's exactly why we need authentic voices for middle class people in Washington to fight for working people. A lot of you here on the call today know a time where things were significantly better for people right in the heart of the city of Milwaukee. We went from a place that provided so much opportunity to a place that has been continuously left behind by corporate greed. Thank you, uh, Barnes. Um, Mr. Williams. Hey, thanks for that question. And uh, uh, yes, absolute uh, yes with a capital Y-E-S. And um, I tell you, but I believe it should be more than that. I mean, because one of the things, as I told you before, you know, I grew up picking cotton for two over 100, didn't have running water till I was 16 years old. And my mother raised six kids off of 335 an hour. I remember the day she called and said, uh, Daryl, I just got a raise to 575. This is after working 35 years. Didn't have uh, the unions and stuff like that uh, where I was from. So I understand the importance of that. But the other side of the coin, and, and when I was uh, interim superintendent of schools in Beloit, I had the opportunity to pay my kids $25 an hour. So surely we should be able to uh, provide uh, $25 uh, above for our, our, our uh, families. And the sad part about this is one thing we don't want to do, and we have to make sure that we don't rearrange the system, and the system needs to be changed, where poor people remain poor and rich people uh, continue to get richer. We have to continue to invest in our education system, make sure that we're investing in the trade so our kids not only have the academic ability, but also the skills and also the social skills. Too many of our kids are unemployed and unemployable. Uh, I was a part of the MTA, um, I taught in uh, Milwaukee Public Schools for oh, uh, 22 years, I was an administrator for many years. And uh, at MATC, I taught there for almost 10 years. So I, as part of the MTEA and part of the ASC, uh, Union for Administrators. And I understand when it act, what that looked like when Act 10 came into play. The healthcare is a major issue for many uh, educators and, and people who are part of many of these uh, establishments. So we have got to do a better job of working with them to make sure that they have self-sustaining family supporting jobs long-term and free education for our kids who are going into the teaching profession. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Trader, same question. Well, $17.50 an hour, if you work at that rate full-time, 22,080 hours, that gives you an annual income of $36,400. I defy anybody on this panel to raise a family on that. I would be, to answer your question, certainly I would answer, I, but I would hope that we would be able to push it much higher than that because you can't live on that. And on top of that, that's full-time. Most people that are earning minimum wage do not have full-time jobs. They only work part-time, which means they have to have more than one job to get that full-time hours. So yes, I would be in favor of anything that would help these people get back into the economy and work full-time and, and not have to, to, to struggle to feed their kids. Another avenue I would take, the 16th Amendment of the Constitution allows the, the United States to tax income. And they passed the income tax law in the early 20th century to redistribute the wealth from the, from the time when the, the robber barons were embarrassingly rich. Well, those people would be embarrassed by the wealth gap that occurs that has occurred in this country in the last 20 years. And I think that a way to focus on this to get the, the, these, these incomes up of, of regular Americans is to, again, go back to the income tax laws and change them so that they go back to redistributing wealth down and not up. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Mr. Olakaro, you have the final word on this question. Great, thank you. I believe in my core that we need to center dignity 
in all of these decisions that we're making, and that will be my focus in the U.S. Senate. And what we're seeing right now is costs going up for housing, gas, just about everything, education, and wages largely uh, staying stagnant. So absolutely, I support um, raising the minimum wage. Now, if you're a small business owner and you're thinking to yourself, well, how am I going to pay for this? I've already been going for weeks and, and months uh, without even paying myself, and I'm barely uh, making ends meet. Uh, that needs to be part of our proposal as well, because how this policy affects the small mom and pop shop here in Milwaukee is completely different than Amazon. In fact, some of those big companies are advocating for higher minimum wage because they know that's the way to take out their smaller uh, competition. So I do believe on top of this, we need incentives and credits to help those small business owners. Now, if you're thinking, well, that that's great, but what if I'm not working right now? and I don't have a job or I'm underemployed. And that's why I believe we need to go even further than all of this. That's why I'm proud to call for a guaranteed minimum income. Uh, this is a proposal that Dr. King called for in the later years of his life when he was focused on economic justice. Uh, this is a form of basic income that's focused as particularly on poverty alleviation based on the idea that in the richest country in the history of the world, we have an immoral level of poverty in our country. And in terms of implementing that, I wanna build on some of the demonstration projects that are going on right now in our country, learn from, the, from those and ultimately scale it up. And this ultimately ties to one of my biggest passions in politics, which is actually hearing from you and talking about solutions that work for you. I wanna open up government to you. That means you know posting up at Sherman Phoenix posting up that coffee makes you black and setting up whiteboards and you know put, laying out legislation where you can directly contribute to legislation right there at those tables and not uh, with these big money special interests uh, in Congress. Thank you, that is the McCarran. revolution. Thank you. Thank you sir. Uh, we've reached the halfway point of our questions and just for a point of uh, clarification everyone understands if I don't get to all the questions, I will stop at the 18 minute mark to give each of you your time, your two minutes for your closing statement. So I'll proceed with the questions now and we're, we're slated to conclude the webinar at 1.45. So at 18 minutes out, I'll cease questioning if I haven't completed all the questions and we'll go into the closing statements. So. Question number five, and Mr. Nelson, you're first in the, in the box. Do you support expanding the Affordable Care Act? And if not, why? Yes, um, I support expanding the Affordable Care Act, but I'll answer this question the way I've done the previous two questions, which is this, we have to go further. We have to go further because we are the only industrialized country in the world that does not have universal health care. And that's unacceptable. It health care is a human right. And this is personal to me too. My wife had cancer. She's a cancer survivor. And my mom had cancer. She had she did pass away. But in both instances, I don't know what we would have done for the care they needed if we didn't have good health insurance. And right now, 30 million Americans cannot say that they have access to good health care. That's wrong. This is the richest nation in the in the country, in the world, pardon me. And you know, if we can say it's okay for the top billionaires to create $1.7 trillion and to take $1.7 trillion in new wealth out of the economy during a pandemic, then we've got money to make sure that everybody gets the care that they need. I just heard a story this morning. There was someone who was admitted to a psychiatric ward and they turned themselves, they realized that they needed help and they were about to be turned away because they weren't sure if they were going, if their insurance was going to accept them. They did fortunately, but he has no idea where he would have been today had it not been for that. Healthcare is a fundamental human right. And I should also say too, that there's a lot of pushback saying, well, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money. Wrong. With Medicare for all, which I fully support, you can cover more and you can spend less. And it will also be, it will also be a tax cut in the way of the property tax cut because the county executive, half of my budget goes to health and human services. A lot of our cases are because people didn't have the care they need up front. And they didn't get, get, to get the care they needed up front because they didn't have health insurance. Think of how many lives we can save on the front end, how we can keep communities together, families together, folks employed at the same time too, at the same time to save money at the local level. Mr. Lee, the same question, sir. 
Thank you, Ricky. You know, when it comes to the American family, I for one wants the best for all Americans, no matter whether you old, young, or where we are in the spectrum. I think that we all deserve a, a healthy uh, lifestyle uh, when it comes to our health. And, um, you know, as a business owner, I, I appreciate the uh, ACA for allowing my family to have coverage. And I think that also with so many families, so many business owners, especially small business owners out there, uh, this allowed them to have some sort of coverage and I think it's better than nothing. Um, but what I have seen from my own experience is that the ACA, we definitely, yes, have to expand on it because of the comprehensiveness that involves in the plan. I think that's what we need to expand and talk about. Um, and I think that uh, that leads to, uh, you know, the other questions because we, we see drug prices are way too high. You know, the care for our elderly is getting very expensive, our veterans and other health concerns. Um, so, you know, the, the ironic thing for me uh, is the fact that we live in a very capitalistic society. And this is the only industry in America that is absolutely has no competition. And I think that to, uh, to give us a chance, to give us the middle class a chance, uh, we, if we could somehow make this into a viable competition, I think everyone will benefit. I think prices will come down. Uh, we will have better access to health and the equity behind health will be fantastic for everybody. But right now, I think this is for the log jam. We have too many providers. We have too many people uh, in the dark. I think most Americans are afraid to go see a doctor or to go to uh, ER because they are afraid they, it's going to bankrupt them. And it's very unfortunate. Uh, so I think transparency, competition uh, will do the job for us. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lazarus. Yeah, I firmly support making sure that we expand uh, Obamacare. Um, you know, I remember talking to a lot of uh, a lot of my uh, former colleagues in the Obama White House and how hard you know, they, they all fought um, and we all fought to make sure that um, we could pass Obamacare and make sure that we got 40 million Americans um, uh, more, more health care. But what I think we need to now make sure that we're doing is ensuring that everyone has health care. Because if we want to make sure that um, we don't only live up to the morals of this country and ensuring that everyone has health care, it's also an economic uh, uh, initiative that we need. Because we can't have people worrying about if they want to start their own business and if they can, you know, what's going to happen to them if they get sick. We can't have small businesses saddled with these extra costs and it being um, much harder for them to grow. We have to make sure that everyone has health care. And that's why I firmly um, uh, believe that health care is a universal right. Uh, and that means that I think we need a strong public option, you know, a Medicare for, uh, for all who want it. So anyone who wants to be on, uh, on, the, on the government public option, they can be on that. Uh, anyone who wants to be on their private insurer, they can be on that as well. Um, but I think this is how we can um, ensure that everyone has access to good, affordable health care, which will not only be good um, for us uh, uh, morally as a country, but also great economically, which will lead to more jobs and, uh, um, and I think more uh, innovation entrepreneurship uh, in this country. Thank you, Mr. Lazary. Um, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Thank you so much. Now, of course, we need to support the Affordable Care Act and the expansion of it, but people like Ron Johnson who wanna get rid of the Affordable Care Act. And it was 10 years ago when Tammy Baldwin was running for the US Senate, when she said the Affordable Care Act didn't go far enough and people looked all confused as if she said something wrong. But the reality is there are so many Americans who don't get the affordable quality care that they deserve. And Tammy Baldwin was right. And I also will be proud to join her and support a Medicare for all. This is the quickest way to get us to universal health care. We're still in the middle of a public health crisis that's been, that was mismanaged from the get go with the former presidential administration. And the least vaccinated population in this country is the uninsured. Even though the vaccines are free, it's because people have a distrust of the healthcare system. People have had adverse interactions. People have been denied care. People have been stuck with surprise bills that almost left them bankrupt if it didn't leave them bankrupt. <clears throat> so while we work to make Medicare for all a reality, there are some immediate steps that we need to take to make sure that people do get the coverage they need. And that includes expanding the Affordable Care Act. 
Some of the other steps are letting Medicare negotiate drug prices, capital and insulin costs, and also expanding Medicaid's, Medicaid services and Medicaid funding under the Affordable Care Act in states like Wisconsin that are controlled by state legislators that uh, would rather play politics than take into account the health of the people they represent. Now, Ron Johnson, like I said, wants to make things worse. He's tried it for years, and he's told us in plain language that he would attempt to repeal the Affordable Care Act again if Republicans get control of the Senate. That is what's on the line right now, a broken health care system that could potentially be made even worse, and we cannot let that happen. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Mr. Williams, hey, you're in the box. Oh, thank you, thank you. Definitely, I I, I would support the Affordable Care Act, and I, you know, as I, I on the front line of the uh, COVID nineteen uh, uh, response here in the state of Wisconsin, you know, I had the opportunity to visit many long term long term care facilities, and so forth. And I, I can't tell you how many people uh, communicated how they were struggling with even just uh, paying for it, and also with the medical costs and so forth. So, and and the health care. It's, it's a critical issue. And I think about my mother who's 82 years old and uh, with a, a ton of medical issues. And uh, every time I, I see her pull out her bag uh, of, of, of pills with the medicine that she has to take, it makes me cringe. I don't know if it's just being elderly or just simply the, the pills that she's taking that's, that, that's killing her faster. But I think all those things right there come into place. But the other side of the coin is how do we pay for some of these things? Someone brought up the issue with veterans. I'm gonna tell you, it bothered me to see veterans fighting a war to, when they couldn't feed their families at home and benefits and so forth, fighting for benefits here that they've earned. But I also think the other piece is how are we gonna pay for this and cover the cost? And uh, what we haven't talked about is the legalization of, of marijuana. And I do support the legalization of marijuana, but within limits, because we could use some of those those funds to help our elderly support some of the Medicare costs that they are struggling to cover. We could also use that to help within our schools as far as funding, uh, help paying for our teachers who then spent 30, 30 45, 40 years uh, teaching, but now can't afford to retire because they can't afford the uh, health care. I support that in, in any efforts to help prove, improve our community and quality of life for our people who are struggling throughout this city, throughout this state, and throughout this nation. It is uh, a key issue and uh, one that, uh, as your United States Senator, I would be addressing because I'm familiar with those issues, especially working in this area for over 25 years. Thank you, sir. Trader, you're on the clock. Uh, unfortunately, in this country right now, healthcare is a privilege, not a right. And I disagree with that position 100%. I would support any laws or provisions that would provide for quality health care through a single payer system that would eliminate any kind of middleman. Well, people are talking about the cost. The cost to health care systems in this country are the middlemen, the insurance companies. If you have a single payer plan run by a government or a single entity, much like the rest of the industrialized world, those costs would come down immediately. So cost is not gonna be an issue once you have a single payer plan. So that's my position on it. We need a single payer plan in this country and, uh, and turn, it, turn healthcare into a right, not a privilege and turn it into a service, not a profit making business. Thank you, Mr. Schrader. Uh, Mr. Bukarski. Thank you very much. As for the question, do I support the Affordable Care Act? I support the Affordable Care Act. We'll advocate for it and we'll do much more than that. Uh, since this campaign started, I've made it clear that I'm in favor of universal health care as a basic right for all Americans. There are a number of points to be made here. With respect to the Affordable Care Act, there are subsidies which are expiring. Those have to be maintained in place. Uh, with respect to Medicaid, there are Medicaid coverage gaps in Wisconsin and elsewhere. Those gaps, have, we have to do whatever we can to eliminate those so people on Medicaid uh, can get coverage. With respect to negotiating drug prices, got to happen. It is Anybody involved in this country knows if you buy it in volume, you get a discount. We should be doing the same thing. Republicans passed a bill in about 2002 to say, okay, we're not going to negotiate drug prices. That's got to be repealed. Now, with respect to insulin prices, I'm an intellectual property lawyer, deal with patent laws. There are certain changes which can be made uh, to, drive, to keep the price of insulin down. That is changes in the patent laws 
could prevent the drug companies from continuing to crank up that price. Uh, with respect to how you're gonna pay for this, I support legalizing marijuana. That money can be invested in healthcare, in education, and could go into 53206, the most incarcerated zip code in the country. There's another issue here with respect to healthcare. That is things that, something that we can do now, it may take a while to put universal healthcare for all in place. And that is people now break an arm, somebody else gets an ear infection, all of a sudden you're $50,000 in debt. And I, as I've made clear around the state, one of the, the first bill I'm gonna introduce is to stop that. That is you can walk into a gas station, supermarket in this country, see people trying to raise money, uh, crowdfund to pay off their medical debt. I'm gonna put in a bill, which was a matter of federal law, stop the use of medical debt to adversely affect the credit rating, which adversely affects your ability to get a job, buy a hire, car, get a new house, do a number of other things. So that is one of the things I will do to on the road to getting universal health care for all Americans. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Olakara, you have the final word on this question. Thank you. The answer is absolutely because if we're serious about expanding dignity and freedom in our country, we need to build a future system that separates healthcare from employment. Has anyone tuning in right now ever felt like you've been stuck in a job that is not fulfilling, you don't like, and potentially is even abusive? But you have to because you can't risk losing your healthcare benefits, not just for yourself, but for your family. That's job lock. And I believe that's extremely restrictive and we need to open that up by guaranteeing healthcare. Now, if we're also not talking about the root issue here of price inflation in healthcare, uh, we're also totally missing the point. You know, think about any industry, if there's a financial incentive to do something, most people are gonna do it, even the good people often are gonna do that. And so right now, the healthcare system profits on you staying in the system, as opposed to keeping you out of the system. And so that's why many of you have had this experience where you go maybe to the emergency room for something relatively simple, but they're charging you all of these things because they're profiting on volume as opposed to keeping you healthy. So we need to change radically uh, the incentives in our healthcare system and invest significantly in preventative health because that's what's going to avoid all these costs down the road, which we all pay for. And finally, we need to make sure that Medicare can negotiate directly to reduce prescription drug prices. And I want to close my comments here on, on this topic, really talking about why this doesn't happen, because what I saw walk, walking through the halls of Congress is a system of legalized bribery, where pharmaceutical and drug companies are directly sponsoring members of Congress. In fact, those members are often out of the office, and these lobbyists are directly handing legislative language with carve outs to these staffers. I want to ban lobbyists from funding the Congress. That's how you get a new healthcare system in America. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Rick, now we're on to question number seven now. And Mr. Lazary, you'll have the opportunity to answer first. Recent records have shown that although violent crime as a whole is on the decline in Milwaukee and other major cities in Wisconsin, gun violence is on the rise and on a record-breaking pace. Not only in Milwaukee, but in other cities, but specifically Milwaukee and, and cities in Wisconsin. What plan do you have or will support to address the issue of gun violence? Thanks, Ricky. And you know, I think, you know, again, this is one of the uh, the, the biggest issues that 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 we have. You know, we're seeing a rise in gun violence, not just in Milwaukee, but around the state and around this country. And, you know, parents shouldn't be scared to bring their kids to school. We shouldn't be scared to walk in a 4th of July parade. And so I think I'm the only one on this stage who's put out a public safety plan where we talked about um, how we can make sure that, um, that we're decreasing crime. And there's a three-pronged approach. Uh, the first one is to make sure that the police have the resources they need to be able to do their job, um, to be able to stop and um, to stop crime and solve crime. Uh, we also need to make sure that we're investing in uh, public infrastructure. So things like after school programs and job training programs. But we also need to make sure that we're dealing with um, with gun reform. And I thought what the Senate passed and the president uh, signed was a was a first step. Um, but we need to make sure that we can pass more meaningful gun reform. And that includes uh, universal background checks and uh, a ban on all assault weapons. These are things that are supported by you know, a vast majority of this country. 
And what we need to be able to do is elect more Democrats who can abolish the filibuster to get this stuff passed because Ron Johnson has taken millions of dollars from the NRA. And he's got no interest in making sure that the people of Wisconsin are that kids and are protected, that you can march in a parade, as I said, without any fear. Ron Johnson is just there to serve the interests of you know, his big donors and special interests like the NRA. We need someone who's going to be held accountable and are going to do what the people of Wisconsin want. And, uh, and, and that's why I think we need to make sure that we've got more stringent uh, gun reform and things that people all believe in, in universal background checks and abolishing the uh, uh, and banning assault weapons. Thank you, Mr. Lazarus. Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Thanks so much. Um, like so many other issues that have come up today and that continue to come up, this is a deeply personal one for me. I know the pain of losing people to gun violence on multiple occasions. And I felt that pain at a very young age, first friend I lost was in high school. And uh, before I graduated, there were a handful more friends that I lost to gun violence in high school. There were several others. And that's why we have to take action. And the good news is that most gun owners agree. And this isn't even a new problem we're experiencing. The overwhelming majority of gun owners support universal background checks. They support red flag laws. And I also support getting weapons out of war, out of civilians' hands by banning assault weapons. Congress has made some progress recently, but as we all know, it's not enough. I'm proud to be a Moms Demand Action Gun Sense candidate for the second time. And I'm also proud of my repeat effort in front of the NRA. Now, the problem is that there are way too many people in the U.S. Senate who are more than willing to put the interests of the gun lobby before the lives of our children, the lives of our family members, the lives of our neighbors. Ron Johnson is bought and paid for by the gun lobby. The $1.2 million he's taken from the NRA is more than Mitch McConnell. And that's exactly why we cannot trust him to keep us safe. Knowing that pain is exactly how you know that I won't back down from the gun lobby. Thank you, sir. Mr. Williams, the same question. Hey, great, great, great question. And um, let me just tell you, I, I, I've, I've lost uh, more, more children that I could count uh, due to gun violence, uh, just working right here in Milwaukee Public Schools. And uh, so, I, I, and you're talking to someone who believes in the right to bear arms, but too many guns are getting in the hands of people who really should not need them. And one thing I realized is that you can't legislate what's inside somebody's heart, but we have got to do a better job of uh, uh, gun reform here within, within this nation is it, key. But we also, I, I, I don't believe in defunding the police. I believe that the restoration of trust needs to happen, uh, uh, needs to be rebuilt between law enforcement and our communities. And as a person who work in emergency management and, and sits on the uh, police executive group. We had those discussions and we believe in that. But we also cannot forget the roots of which all this starts. And it starts with poverty, economic uh, disparities, and uh, you know drug addiction, and also lack of mental health services uh, within our communities, which is one of the things that I fall for in emergency management to get that here for our state. But we also have to make sure that we're doing what's right by our children because education is, is still our passport to the future, as Malcolm X said. And a lot of times we say children are our future, but we rarely invest in them. We say it with our mouth, but we rarely do it with action. In NPS, I started the Student Leadership Initiative to invest in those uh, neighborhoods and schools uh, and those children uh, so that we could address some of these issues at an early age. So whenever they uh, get older, they, they, they want to be involved in those things. I think Frederick Douglass says, easy to build strong children than repair broken men. And I've done that uh, throughout the education system over 25 years. And also, uh, we have got to make sure that those kids have the education that they need, not only after, while they're in school, but also once they leave our schools. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, Mr. Schrader, you're in the box. Would you repeat the question again, please? Yes. Records have shown that although some violent crime is on a decline in the city of Milwaukee and other cities in, in Wisconsin, gun violence is at an all time high and on set uh, on course for a record breaking year. What programs will you support to address this issue? Okay, I'm glad I asked you because I was focusing on a, a, a different aspect of it. 
I was a social worker in, in Milwaukee County for three years in foster care. And I went to um, approximately 400 calls all over the city from, from Fourth and Brown to Whitefish Bay. And I had to call the police. Now foster care was a rough duty. I mean, you were dealing with child abuse and, and sexual assault and things like that. And we were dealing with some pretty rough characters, both in Whitefish Bay and Fourth and, Fourth and Brown. In fact, the people in Whitefish Bay thought they had more privilege. Anyway, let's get away from that. Um, I had to call a police once in those 400 calls to help me deal with a situation. We need to stop sending police to situations where a social worker could walk in there with abilities to deal with these things rather than be, and I understand why you, as a person who thinks, you, you know, goes in there with authority and somebody questions that authority, that sets you off. If you're a social worker, that doesn't happen. If you're a police person, I understand why that happens. So we need, first of all, we need to set, get, get these programs, and we had these programs and we got rid of them. They talk about defunding police. We've defunded social services for years and we need to get those back. So um, in, in terms of generally, I would get money out of, out of campaigns. I would get rid of these lobbyists, pass laws to, again, to nullify the, the Citizens United decision so that more people can run for office and you get a broader perspective. And these people will not be, many of them will not be influenced by the lobbyists. So if we can get more people to pass broader laws, uh, in, in, um, uh, influence groups like the NRA will lose power because Okay, you you can tell me to do this, but I'd rather have my kids safe than get a you know get whatever little pittance of money you can give me. So um, that would be my first step. Thank you, Brader. Uh, Mr. Pekarski, gun violence. What programs would I support to address gun violence? I, one of the first people I met when I started kindergarten at age five was a, a guy who later lost his life to vi gun violence at age 21 at the corner of Concordia and Sherman Boulevard in Milwaukee. It's about two blocks north of the actual Sherman Park. He was a friend of mine um, for a long time. There are people dying right now because guys like Ron Johnson took $1.25 million from the NRA and aren't doing a thing to uh, stop the slaughter that's going on in our schools and our streets. And I think there are solutions here to the gun problem, which can be re recognized. There are a number of competing uh, interests here. One is the second amendment. The other is the fact that there are a lot of responsible gun owners in this country. Um, we're not coming after anybody's guns. We are here to make certain that this slaughter in our schools and on our streets stops. I think we got to start by looking at the Second Amendment, which says that the um, well-armed militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. There are a lot of things we can do, for example, eliminating mags, eliminating automatic weapons, semi-autos, eliminating AR-15s. The people who are responsible gun owners do not need an AR-15 to kill a deer, and they don't need an AR-15 to defend their home. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be done over time in terms of providing mental health resources, providing economic development in the communities, uh, abolishing the filibusters, electing Democrats to get some people in office who are willing to do something about it. I'm willing to consider all of those uh, solutions, and we have got to do something to get this whole thing under control considering all of the interests involved. Thank you, sir. Mr. Olakar. One of the most profound conversations I had uh, on this issue was with the heroic Parkland students who I've had the opportunity to collaborate over the years uh, during my days as the CEO of the Millennial Action Project. And after the horrific shooting that happened in Parkland, they came over and said, you know, we're not here to support Democrats or Republicans. We're here to ensure that our friends can go to school safely without the threat of gun violence. And with that mindset, after the more recent shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde and the other ones, uh, I was looking out seeing who's the leader 
who's going to bring people together across party lines to not just find common ground, but higher ground. And what I decided was, let's show the people of Wisconsin what it looks like for me to be your U.S. senator right now. And so we convened a town hall with people who are gun control advocates, gun rights advocates. We had Democrats there. We had Ron Johnson voters there. We brought everyone together and found the real nuances that really show that there's a lot more that we can agree on. And I believe that the higher ground here is this culture of responsibility and respect to break the cycle uh, of gun violence. That's why I'm calling for gun licensing across the board. The same principle of driving a car should apply to guns where you get training, you pass a test and you have a gun license. Now, if you're hearing this and you think, well, this sounds idealistic, but is, is it really possible? I'm proud to be the only one who's running for the U.S. Senate right now who's been directly involved in passing gun violence prevention legislation. Working with those Parkland students, we proposed and passed the legislation to authorize and fund the CDC to study gun violence as a public health issue against the conventional wisdom, against all the odds. We got that passed through both chambers of Congress, signed into law, lifted that ban, passed the first gun violence prevention legislation in over two decades. That's why I'm running on real legislative change, and we got bipartisan support around that. Thank you, Mr. Olakara. Mr. Nelson, you are now on the clock. All right, thank you. Well, I want to leave you three things. Number one, a story. Number two, gun violence reforms. Number three, campaign finance reform. A personal story. My father is six-year-old and an eight-year-old. Every time I drop them off at school, and I mean every time, I wonder, is this going to be the next? Is this going to be the next one? So this is personal. And I am not the only parent. And I imagine every parent thinks that. Maybe even Ron Johnson does. So that's why this is personal to me. Number two, here are a few things that we can do for gun violence reform. Number one, red flag laws. Number two, universal background checks. Number three, banning high capacity weapons. Four, renewing the assault weapons ban. Number five, closing the gun show loophole. Number six, closing the boyfriend loop loophole. Number seven, closing the Charleston loophole and violence prevention programs. So this is a comprehensive approach, yes, but it also shows exactly where we stand on this issue. We have so much work to do. And when the assault weapons ban was taken out, when it expired back in 2004, that was at or around the time that you saw the number of shootings go up and using um, assault weapons. So that's pretty close to saying, we need to do this. Finally, campaign finance reform. The reason why some, there are some Republicans like Ron Johnson that really think that this is okay not to do anything, but there's a lot of good people, Republicans who are saying, well, how am I gonna win the next election? We have got to get special interests under control. The NRA, the gun lobby, and the way that you do that is campaign finance reform. And the way you get real campaign finance reform is by repealing Citizens United. You repeal Citizens United for the Democrats, controlling the US Senate, getting a working majority to repeal the filibuster and expanding the court. We have a long way to go. We have to start somewhere. And that somewhere is here in Wisconsin because we have to win this seat. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Lee, you have the final word on this question. Thank you, Ricky. You know, as an American, we should not have to be fearful of just going out to celebrate America's birthday on 4th of July. We should not be fearful sending our kids to school or yet let our, you know, wife and kids walk in the neighborhood. And I think this is an issue that's been faced with us for many years now. And I think that we could do some things to tighten up the loopholes to make sure that the gun laws in this country uh, is much stronger than what it is. And, and anything that we do, there's always an opposition. And I agree with what Congress has done uh, with the gun law that was just passed into law, which I think that mental health is also a big part of this equation. But the problem that I think it's the bigger issue is the fact that we have such a toxic political environment where what you've seen is that uh, some people is already on the edge. And when they hear these rhetorics from our leader and elected officials, it drove them to the edge. And I think that Americans, we, it's about time that we come together and we stand together 
And the only power that you and I have is that vote. And we have to come together to make sure that we secure our democracy so that we could go out and celebrate, have a picnic, uh, have a get together with family, friends, you know, in the neighborhood and wherever you want to, because that's liberty and that's freedom. And right now we don't have that. Uh, and I also want to mention that this cultural war has been waged on the middle class and the working class for so many centuries by the rich. And we have to be cautious of that. And again, your power and my power is to vote. So we have to come out and put the right people in place so that we can solve this issue. Thank you. So we are now at that point in the uh, webinar where we're at the 18 minute mark. And as I stated, we're going to uh, cease questioning right now. We've answered six of the 10 questions that we have prepared, but I think we've done a good job. Before we go into your final closing statements, I'd like to thank you all for being a part of our panel today. You've done a great service to your constituency and the voting public of Wisconsin. And I wish you all good luck on your campaigns. Mr. Lee, you have the opportunity to begin first with your closing statement. Thank you, Ricky, for a wonderful job. And thank you, uh, President Clarence and the NWCSP Milwaukee chapter for putting this together. Um, you know, I, I, I wanna share this with the audience. I wanna let you know that I'll never forget my, my humble beginning you know, what my parents taught me and what I've learned through my years of experience. As a person born to a war-torn country, lived to poverty, grew up in inner city, uh, facing cultural and language barriers, I am not a politician. Uh, what I want to do is bring a voice to those people that don't have one. And that's why I'm running. Um, you know, if you feel like you're a stranger in your own country, if you feel that the government's not working for you, if you feel like you're working two, three jobs and you still can't make ends meet, you feel like the rich people are getting richer, but your situation is getting worse by the year, I will fight for you. I'm the only candidate here that's 100% grassroots. Understand that we send the same people to Washington, D.C. and hoping that they answer our calls. Einstein said it best, if you do the same thing, expect a different result, it's insanity. With my campaign, I don't have anyone to answer to besides the people that lives in Wisconsin and the American people. I will have that 110% autonomy to do the job for Wisconsin. So I ask for your support and hope to be the next United States Senator from Wisconsin. Thank you very much. Cool Lee, LeeForWisconsin.com. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Uh, Mr. Nelson, you have two minutes, sir. Thank you for the invitation, the opportunity to um, address a number of these issues. So I'm Tom Nelson, Audigamy County Executive. The number one issue here is can beat Ron Johnson. I'm the only one from a red part of the stand who won election six times. Three as a legislator, three as a county executive. I can get, I can do my job at once. I mean, I can get elected once I get to Washington, I can do my job. The three areas that I focused on, I think are issues that will have a transformative effect on all communities within the state, economic security, health security, and the climate crisis. We didn't touch on the climate crisis, but I think that this is an existential, um, this is an existential threat. And that if we don't get this under control, um, issues such as campaign finance reform, healthcare, minimum wage, um, it's, it's just not gonna matter. And we have to do this. And I think that whoever's the next U.S. Senator is gonna have to lead and lead aggressively on this. And someone from Wisconsin can do this because we're the birthplace of the modern day environmental movement and one of the top manufacturing states in the country. I would like to leave with this. One of the high points of my public service is working with a local labor union to save a paper mill. They were able to do the impossible. We stood up to a big bank. We opened up a mill that had shut down. We brought back 300 jobs. And it turned up three means and those were receiving their profit sharing checks. 
That is a story that can only happen in Wisconsin. We need to revitalize the deindustrialization of the state and of this country that has devastated the urban center as well as rural parts of the state in areas like the Fox Valley. I wrote a book on it, One Day Stronger. You can go to my website to learn more about that, but this is the type of passion, type of service that I've done that I want to take to Washington and not just helping the people in my community, but all over the state. Tom Nelson, nelson4wi.com. I put some information in the chat. Um, check out the campaign. Thanks again for your attention and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. And FYI, uh, global warming and the effects on our environment was one of our questions, and I wish we'd had an opportunity to get to it. Um, Mr. Olakara, you have two minutes for your closing statement. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, to NAACP, to all of you for tuning in. Uh, President Nicholas, thank you so much uh, for the honor of being here. Have any of you who are tuning in right now ever felt like members of Congress are not working for you and they're not even doing their job? Uh, the answer is yes, they're not doing their job. And from my experience working with members, uh, I saw too much of that, where they're literally across the street dialing for dollars and fundraising for their reelection. Their North Star being self-preservation as opposed to actually working for you, working together across party lines to get real things done. And it is unacceptable. That's why we need systemic change on so many of these issues. And we need to be honest about it. You know, if you ask the basic question, what does America think about black people? You're gonna find the answer in our laws and in our legislation. And the systems behind that are extremely revealing of what's really going on. I'm running to change that system that's replacing Ron Johnson by activating a new coalition here in Wisconsin, but that's really going beyond that. Why, is, why are there so many people like Ron Johnson who are enabling uh, this corruption right now? I strongly believe that we need to build a coalition that I call the exhausted majority. People who are coming together, not just Democrats, but also politically homeless Repu uh, Republicans and independents. And that's why you see our motley crew of support. You know, we're endorsed by everyone like our former Lieutenant Governor Barbara Laden and Paul Higginbotham, the first African-American to serve on the Wisconsin Court of Appeals. We have people like multi-platinum recording artist Akon uh, supporting our campaign and Republicans in Nielsville. I mean, you just go across the board. This is a transformative uh, campaign and we want real legislative change. And I'll just leave you with this. My favorite Einstein quote is the following. Uh, vision without execution is hallucination. Here for candidates who have real legislative accomplishments, I'm running on real change, not just talking about it. Thank you. Thank you sir. Um, although I didn't, we didn't have the opportunity to ask and receive your answers to these questions, the final four questions, I would highly recommend and suggest that you put them on your website because these are the questions that are important to your constituents in Milwaukee area. They are. Uh, what is your position on global warming? And do you believe that the increase in natural disasters, forest fires, hurricanes, tornadoes, et cetera, are a result of climate change? Um, would you support a reparations bill? Why or why not? Do you support student loan forgiveness? What are two organizations that you belong to or are affiliated with that are very important to you? Like I said, I wish we could have gotten your answer to these questions, but I'm sure your constituents would love to see it on your website. Mr. Petarski, your uh, two minutes final statement, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tonsell, President Nicholas, and the entire NAACP. Thank you very much for this opportunity. My name is Peter Petarski. I'm running for the United States Senate, where I will vote to codify Roe v. Wade. The first issue on my website, PetarskiForWisconsin.com, and on the literature is protecting our democracy. We have to protect our democracy or we don't get what we want and what we need, what this country needs on the other 14 issues, universal health care, universal broadband, uh, protecting LGBTQ plus rights, uh, reproductive rights, uh, legalizing marijuana for the reasons I've laid out, uh, supporting workers and unions and union jobs, sustainable agriculture, affordable education. Uh, there are many different uh, issues to that. Uh, ending systemic racism, action to protect our climate, justice for veterans who were there for us, and we've got to be for them, there for them for the rest of their lives, and stopping wealth inequality, anti-corruption, and ending forever wars. 
you want to read a little bit more about me, uh, you can look at the About tab at pekarskiforwisconsin.com. Tried to explain a little bit about it. We're on Twitter at twitter.com forward slash pekarski for WI. Uh, the bottom line here is retiring Ron Johnson, uh, who has uh, violated his oath of office, as I explained earlier, taken $1.25 million from the NRA and nothing, done nothing to stop the slaughter on our streets, and has given $200 million, uh, $500 million of your money uh, to some people who gave him millions of dollars for his campaign. Uh, I am seriously qualified by virtue of my education and experience to shred Ron Johnson's policies uh, throughout the campaign on the debate stage and off, and to represent all the people of Wisconsin on the many critical, complicated, technical and legal issues which face us uh, at home, in cyberspace, national security and foreign affairs. I ask for your support and your vote on August 9th and November 8th. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Prater. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank the NAACP and the panelists for the opportunity to, to join you here and for the uh, thanks for all these great questions. Um, instead of reiterating some of the points that have already been made about why I think I should be the, in, in, it would be in the best interest of, of me to replace the incumbent in this primary, I'd like to ask all of, the, all of you and all of the viewers out there to seriously consider volunteering to work the polls for your local community. I'm hearing that there are a critical shortage of, of election inspectors and poll workers, and that this, this situation is a serious threat to democracy. For example, I've heard that the city of Milwaukee is currently short about 500 poll workers. I've worked the election as an election inspector at the polls in previous elections and will be working this one if I wasn't on the ballot. Uh, I think it's the citizens duty to democracy and their patriotic duty for our country to step, step up and serve in this, com in this capacity. Thank you, whatever, sir. whatever your political persuasion might be, volunteer to make certain that the election process goes smoothly as possible for your fellow neighbors and citizens. You, you can be an eyewitness to the process and get an added benefit of seeing how elections are, co are conducted at the ground level and how ridiculous the claims are that they may be hacked or stolen there. I cannot stress the importance of this duty as a citizen of, the, of a democracy. Contact your election commission, city clerk, or county clerk in the area and volunteer your services to work at the polls. And if you want to hear uh, more about what my positions are, my website is davidschraderforsenate.com, for ussenate.com. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Schrader. Mr. Williams. Dr. Williams. Hey, thank you all very much. And I thank you all for this opportunity. And thank you all for being inclusive, the NAACP. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is not, Ron Johnson is not the most important person in this race. You are. This is not an Eddie Murphy movie where you vote on the name you know of the person who has the most money. This is about voting for someone who you know will work for you and somebody with some knowledge, skills, and background in the areas that's really critical to us at this time. We talked about education, veterans issues, bridging the racial divide, climate change a little bit, bringing people together and job creation. When we're talking about education, don't you want somebody sitting at the table with 26 years of ed educational experience, someone who's been a teacher, administrator, national principal of the year, and interim superintendent of schools? When we're talking about what works best for our veterans and those issues, don't you want somebody with 29 years of experience who's worked with NATO, who's worked on those issues, who knows them intimately? So this is the question that you have to ask yourself. When those areas are talked about at the highest level of our government, we want the best results for us here at the state and local level. Don't you want somebody with that type of knowledge, skills, and background at the table? That is key. The other side of the coin is, don't you want someone who's going to fight for your voice? As I mentioned to you earlier, you know, we appreciate the, the, the opportunity to be here today, but WTMJ4 is also hosting a, a, um, a, a TV forum where many of the voices that you hear here are not going to be allowed to be seen and heard by Wisconsinites. So the fundamental question is this, in good conscience, do have, why would we be voting? We're asking people to vote for people who they have never even seen or been able to hear the voices of in the televised debate. This is key. So we're asking all people who are listening, tell WTMJ4 that all voices in Wisconsin matter 
and be a part of the Tuscaloosa debate. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. All right, again, well, I just wanna say thank you so much to the NAACP for having me today, for putting together this important forum. We've all talked about a whole lot, but the one thing I wanna be sure that everybody takes away from this is that I'm in this race to fight for you, to continue to fight for you. Right now, we face some unprecedented challenges. But while Ron Johnson wants to do the work to divide us, I think he does not understand that each and every one of us has so much more in common than any of us will ever have with a self-servant, out-of-touch multimillionaire like him. That's why this race is not going to be about red or blue, black or white, left or right. It's about those who've been at the top and the rest of us who've been left at the bottom. Because if we're going to change Washington, we have to change the people we send to Washington. We need to elect people who understand where we're coming from, who get us, who share our experiences. I'm running for the Senate to be a voice for families like mine and communities like mine, to rebuild the middle class, to give every single person a fair shot at the American dream. Now, I've always been driven by the belief that better is possible. I know each and every one of you believe it too. It's why you're joining us today. And it's why you do the hard work day in and day out. And because of that hard work, I wanna remind you that this won't be easy either. But I know that when we come together, we have the power to make the American dream an American reality for everybody. It's gonna be a tough campaign, but I'm very excited that in the latest polling, I'm leading Ron Johnson. I'm the strongest Democrat against Ron Johnson. I'm the only Democratic candidate that is leading Ron Johnson with independent voters. We can't just wake up on August 10th and decide to put together a campaign that's gonna win on November 8th. We have the momentum right now, the support from elected leaders, community leaders, and individuals all across the state of Wisconsin who are gonna power us to victory. And I'm asking for your support as well. That shows us how possible winning this election is, the groundswell of support that we've seen since we launched just under a year ago. With your support, I absolutely know that we can do this. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And finally, but certainly not least, Mr. Lazarus. Well, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, this was an incredible forum and really appreciate you all joining us on a, a lovely Saturday afternoon. Um, you know, I, uh, I want to make sure and I'm running for this race because I just think we need someone who has a history and track record of delivering results. And I'm the only person on this stage who doesn't just talk about these issues, but has actually delivered on them. When it comes to raising wages, I don't just talk about that. We've done it. We pay a $15 minimum wage in Pfizer form. When it comes to creating jobs, that's not something that I just talk about or use as a talking point. Uh, it's something that I've done. Um, we've created thousands of good paying union jobs right here in Wisconsin. And when it comes to making sure that we're bringing jobs and investment to this state, that's something that we've done as well. We've made sure that 80% of our materials were sourced right here from Wisconsin. And a third of our construction projects were done by minority owned, women owned, disadvantaged businesses. You contrast that with Ron Johnson, who is actively moving to try to push jobs to South Carolina, who's active, who voted to make sure that it was easier to uh, move jobs overseas and who only voted for a tax cut so that he could enrich himself and his friends. This is what's at stake in this election. And, you know, uh, you know, I've got a daughter who's 10 months old. And when I'm looking at her, I'm not thinking about just November. I'm thinking about 10, 20 years from now. Is she going to grow up in Ron Johnson's Wisconsin, where communities are pitted against each other, where politicians are robbing women of their right to make their own health care decisions and kids are living in fear of gun violence every day? Where if the rich are getting richer and everyone else has to fend for themselves? Or is my daughter and all of our kids going to be able to grow up in the Wisconsin that we all believe in, the Wisconsin that we love and fear is slipping away? I'm in this race and asking for your vote because I want to make sure that together, we don't just fight for our values, but we actually deliver them. And one day we'll be able to look all of our kids in the eye and we'll be able to tell them about everything that we accomplished together to build a stronger, fairer, and more democratic Wisconsin. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you all for being a part of our forum. I'd like to thank uh, President Mr. Uh, Clarence Nicholas for putting this together. Uh, a lot of work went into this and we, do look forward to the possibility of having another forum before the primary or certainly after the primary. I now turn the forum back over to uh, President Nicholas for his closing remarks. Thank you, Chairman Townsville. I wanna thank each candidate for your participation in today's forum. If other organizations wish to join us with an additional forum, 
as a sponsor, please contact me. Each of you will be hearing from me as soon, very soon, about the next forum. Thank everyone for attending and have a great weekend. Thank you.